Today, we're going over the Uenta Highline Trail, which was the most challenging 107 miles that I've actually ever personally hiked in my hiking career. And I'm going to explain to you why on this podcast slash walkthrough. Now, this is going to rehash a little bit of my experience, but not the whole thing because I'm going to be coming out with a documentary. So I don't want to be giving away the whole thing. But I'm also, but really what this is going to be is a pretty much a day by day walkthrough of what to expect when you're hiking. And so you can kind of think of this as a, a audio trail map for your time on the UN to Highline Trail. So you can listen to it before, you can listen to it during trail to, to figure out what you're going to get into. But if you, the, the real thing with this too is if you want a free downloadable copy of my exact itinerary with elevation, mileage, notes, all of that cool stuff, and then you can be able to customize it for yourself, just click the link below and you can get that for free. But let's kind of get into it. So what I'm going to do with this is actually I have a map here for you. And I was doing this as a YouTube live before. And then I was like, you know what? I actually am going to just use this as a map. This would look way better if I actually just did this. Okay. So here's the first thing that you need to know about the UN's Highline Trail. The UN's Highline Trail is basically a east to west uh, out and back or point to point trail. Most people are going to start in the east here, and that is at McKee Draw. That's a trailhead, and then they're going to end over here at uh, Hayden Pass. So it was about a four and a half hour drive for me from Laramie, and I ended up parking at McKay, McKee Pass. And the the thing with this is that you're going to need, because it's a point to point, you're going to need some kind of shuttle system. And so what I use is the Mountain Transport Shuttle, and since I parked here, they were going to pick me up at the end, take me back up here, and then through back to McKee Trailhead. And that's exactly what happened. Mountain Transport is their name. They were they did a really good job, and I left them a review. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend them because I'm not quite sure how the heck else you're going to get all the way back here, which is about a four-and-a-half-hour drive. You could hitch, but I think it might be kind of tough. All right, so what did I do the first day? So the first day, I took a drive, a whole little drive from Laramie, Wyoming to McKee Draw Trailhead. Okay, so the first thing that I did here was I ended up hiking over to East Park Reservoir. Now, I camped right in here right off of the trail. And the reason basically I, I did this was because I was getting in late, number one, but also because there's a 16-mile dry section after the East Fork, or after, yeah, the East Fork park reservoir rather and uh, i just kind of wanted to camel up with water sleep there i mean and yeah i was just going to sleep in my car but i just eventually ended up hiking in which may have not been the best decision because of the fact that i encountered a shit ton of cows in this area here that would not leave me alone and i had to chase them off with sticks at night to get them away from my campsite but then right after that i got doused with a giant storm Worst storm on trail. So maybe I should have just, <laughs> but anyway, that's what I did. Now there is a ton of streams that you're going to pass up to this point. So you don't really have to pack, pack that much water. Then you're also going to realize that the trail is actually rocky AF. And that's going to be your kind of your first bout with that. Okay. The next day. So day two, and sorry, I'm looking over here at my notes here that are off the screen. Day two is an extremely easy start to the day. I'm going to delete this track because that does not make any sense. So day two is an extremely easy start to the day. Probably like the first eight miles are super easy where you really don't even need trekking poles, in my opinion, if you don't want to use them. You could probably just stow them away. And it's very flat, but... The one thing that you're going to realize with this is the theme of the entire trail, which is the fact that it can be a bit challenging to navigate because it's not that well traveled. So you're going to have offshoots of social trails. A lot of these parts, especially when you get into the open high areas or open parks, there's going to be really no trail or a very faint trail. So you have to be looking out for Karens. You have to be, you're going to be constantly on your phone, looking at your track in this whole thing, right? And so this is going to be kind of your first sign that this trail isn't like a normal trail, like a normal highway. Now, one thing I should mention is how much water I took after the East Park Reservoir. And for the 16 mile dry stretch, I brought two liters of water and made sure that I had a bunch of electrolytes in each of those. 
so that I wasn't going to be carrying five freaking liters of water and carrying like, you know, 14 extra pounds of weight on me. So I only brought two and I would have been good if I didn't get to around eight miles in. And then, then I accidentally spilled all of my, my remaining liter of water all over my shoes. That sucked. And that kind of hurt. So wouldn't recommend that, but I think you could definitely get away with two liters of water, uh, especially if you're leaving way early in the morning like I did and it's cold for the first you know, two, three hours of your hike. Two liters would not have been a problem. I made it with one liter, so <laughs> two liters would have been great, although I was kind of hurting and very dehydrated at the end of by the time I got water. Now, I was also very surprised, kind of going back to the off-trail thing, I was surprised at how I actually got off trail on this. And, you know, again, that's going to be kind of the theme for this entire trip. But one thing I do want to mention if you're watching on video is the fact that I did download this GPX line from the All Trails website. And in some parts, it's going to be like right here, it's way off of the actual trail. So because this trail is just kind of a weird trail where uh, people take different routes and things like right here, I mean, you can see on the video, it, this is, you know, it's going to show that you're actually off the trail. However, also this says the, you went, well, that will eventually say that you went to Highline as well. And that's not the GPX track. So be aware of your maps. And if you are finding yourself off, off route, you know, really kind of look for Karens, look for those you know, depressions in the grasses and stuff like that. So you can actually tell if you're on a trail or if you're on an elk trail. But also, you know, signage is going to be huge on this. Very, very huge. So make sure you're paying attention there. Now, that night where I ended up camping it was a place called Hacking Lake. So Hacking Lake is down here. It was about a 20-some mile day. And Hacking Lake is actually going to be off trail. But this is where I actually found the first people of the entire trip. I hadn't seen anybody up until this point, the second day at, at about 5.30 when I was coming down this road right here and eventually getting into Hacking Lake. So I did not go all the way to Hacking Lake. I actually camped a little bit before it on the stream, but I was kind of using the time to stretch out, hydrate. My hip was having problems. And I think a big part of that was because of how dehydrated I actually got from that dry section. So Day three now is going to be where you actually get to the Lady Peak Trailhead. This is where it's very common for people to start the trail. And the reason why is because this is all when you're starting to get into the high country right over here. A lot of people will start at Lady Peak and they'll bypass the first 24 miles, which if you are just going for the high line and you don't care about completing it like formally, I would totally recommend doing that. For me, I needed to complete the entire trail in its entirety the way it was created. That's just me. But if you're just out there to look for, and it's going, to, and it would be 24 miles shorter. If you're out there to look for that, and and look for the true like more higher line experience, just start at Lady Peak. Like I said, this is where the trail actually gets good. Now, if you're looking on the map right now with me, you see that my GPX line went. North Lady Peak around the north side of it, I actually went down to the to the left here or down to the south and did the again the Uanta High Line. Now, right on this southwest aspect of Lady Peak is when I encountered my first snowfield. So that was pretty interesting. But no microspikes were used there or on this entire route, even though this is Utah's highest snow year. Now after Lady Peak, you are going to then get into some higher country here. And yeah, I mean, you're at like 11.5, 11, yeah, 11, 11,500 feet. You're going to be getting into a lot of the high country. And this is where I realized that I really made a massive mistake in the shoes that I was wearing. I was wearing ultra lone peaks, which don't have the best padding on them. And I realized I should have probably been wearing my ultra temps, although I would have completely trashed them on this trail because of how freaking wet your feet get which I'll talk about in a second here. But I would totally recommend more padding on your shoes is way better than less padding because from now on, this entire trail is just going to be a rock-strewn clusterfuck. That's really what it is. So having good shoes is going to, good padded shoes is going to make a huge difference. As you uh, stroll through this high country here, you're going to get to a place called Lake Wild. 
right after Lake Wild is where Gabbro Pass is. And that's going to be your first pass of the trip. A lot of people, if you're starting at Lady Peak late, will probably camp at Lake Wild. Now, when I was coming through here, it was in the mid-morning, and there was still a bunch of snow in Gabbro Pass at 11,689 feet. And so my idea was I was going to actually scramble up this finger ridge here and go around a, a rocky strewn pass to, to kind of bypass it. And I was doing that for a second, then realized that was kind of stupid and it was going to take a way long amount of time. <laughs> So I just ended up shooting up through the snow bank or the, the lingering snow, did come in from the right, it was way too steep, came and swung down to the left and was able to, to get through it with no problem at all. Now, I did encounter some people on that finger ridge that were trying to bypass it and they successfully did it, although I do think that they used a lot more effort to do that when they could have just went straight through. So now again, you're going to see like here is the one thing I want to talk about, which is the Highline Trail, the All Trails Highline Trail GPX track, which was often, often very not as was not exactly on the trail. As you see here, right here is the Highline and this is off by quite a bit. So if you're this isn't a big deal when you are actually in the high country and you can kind of see where you're going, but when you're in the woods and you're trying to figure out where the trail is and things, just know that the the all trails map is a little bit off the GPX route. So number one, you have to have downloaded maps on your phone for this if you actually want to be any semi-effective navigating. But you're going to have to compare and contrast the GPX track versus what you have on your map as the static and it was kind of at this point too where I, I was thinking okay I'm going to actually navigate with my watch which is was a lot easier than pulling out my phone the whole time I'm going to use the navigation feature on my watch however then I realized that the or that the all trails map was kind of off so it would work sometimes but if you can get a really solid GPX track download it to your watch that would be money after Gabbro Pass you're going to be getting to what's called Dead Man Lake so looking at the map here you're going to have a basically a giant descent down these topo lines and then a giant ascent back up them. And when I got to this point, I really didn't think that that made a whole lot of sense when I could just go when I didn't need any water, number one, and I could just go around the cirque on these topo lines to the north and northeast. And so that's what I'm doing. And I'm trying to make this visual as, as good as possible for people that are just listening audio right now. But if you do want to see a visual of the map, hop on to YouTube for this. So I just ended up going around it and then you're eventually you're going to cross White Rocks Lake, whatever. It's fine. As I was getting between White Rocks and Chepetka, I actually met a family and a dad told them where I was going to try to get to tonight, which was all the way to Fox Lake, which he severely doubted I could get to, which severely made me push even harder to make sure that I was getting there. I had about 11 and a half miles to go at, at 1.30 and he was telling me how he was just, and I had already gone 10, 11 at that point, 13 at that point, 14 at that point. He did not hold back telling me, well, you know, I did a 18 mile day all downhill one time and it just crushed me. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. You don't look like you're in shape. So that would probably be why. Don't doubt me. Anyway, gets to Chepeka, jumped in there. And as you can see, Again, on the All Trails GPX track, they must have done a resupply right here, which I didn't do. So I was continuing on the High Line up this way, up to the north of that, and through Chepetka, jumped in. That was great. Now, for, between Chepetka and your next pass, which is called North Pole Pass, you're going to be entering the woods in this valley here. Now, a couple things with this woods. One, the track and my maps, everything was wrong with where the trail was. There was no trail. There was a bunch of blowdown. It was thick and I, it was terrible. So I got severely off trail, not severely, but I got off trail for about 20 minutes here and that really sucked and I was really frustrated. The other thing with this is that, again, don't have, have zero expectation of dry feet on this because as you can see, you're going through a bunch of these bogs and whenever you see these bogs on the map, just know that you're going to get extremely wet feet again. There was actually about a 70 yard basically dash through this where, yeah, I mean, I had to go literally just straight through water. It was just straight through water. So going through that in the valleys and then going back up to the high line or to where you get to higher country, 
and having wet feet and having that friction, but then also having rocks on top of that, it's a really good way, at least for me to get blisters, which is why at least I wanted more padding on my, on my shoes, but there's really not much you can do with drying your shoes out because as soon as you do, which is what I did at Chapeca, I dried them out because I was going through bogs, you know, hours before that, they just got wet again. And so just know that your feet are really never going to be dry on this trail, which is a big challenge of it. Okay. So eventually you're going to get over North Pole Pass, which was a really cool pass. And then it kind of, you kind of stay at this this plateau for a while. And then you have this giant descent. Well, it's only a two and a half mile descent down into basically Fox Lake, which is where I was camping. And let me tell you about this descent. This was the worst descent of the trail. This descent took me a long time. And it could have been because I was already getting smashed because I was at 20 some miles. And I just wanted to prove that guy wrong. But it kind of switch backs it there's giant rocks there's just rocks everywhere it's it's a tough 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 pass to go over and really really not that fun there's just so many rocks there it's a it's a very slow descent so don't think that you're gonna get to the top of there and then be at fox lake in a jiffy because he ain't eventually got to fox lake was gonna camp up on the north side of it but there really was no places. There was a bunch of sites in the woods here. One thing with Fox Lake, though, is the fact that there's a bunch of kind of aggressive deer. And I, I tried to bribe this one deer to set up my tent for 10 bucks. 10 bucks, get it? But she wouldn't do it. But they kind of bothered me all night. And so I had to shoo them away as well, just like the cows. So just be aware of that. I think deer are quite active there because... Must be a kind of a semi popular place for people. Okay, now day four comes along, and from Fox Lake, really for a good six, seven miles, you're totally in woods. You're just immersed in the woods. And I was kind of thinking, what the heck am I doing in the woods this long? I thought this was a high line. So that was a little bit frustrating. It was a long wooded patch, and your again, your feet are going to be super wet. You're going to be crossing bogs. Not a lot of fun stuff. A lot of, lot of, lot of streams and wet stuff. This day also is going to have some spots where there really doesn't look like there is any trail. Now you're kind of like paralleling this river and I'm trying to find it here on the map where the heck it is. But as you're, you're kind of paralleling this river to get up to Anderson Pass, to eventually you get to these meadows. But there is just a lot of, t I mean, I wasn't on trail for a good, probably mile. There was no trail. And so I was kind of just using a general direction on my GPX where GPS, where I was just kind of traveling. So you kind of lose a trail in there. There's supposed to be this, you know, on my map, it says there's a Canyon Forest Service Station. Never saw that. Definitely did never, never saw that. Eventually, though, you were going to keep working your way up, keep working your way up, and you're going to get to the highest pass on the trail, which is called Anderson Pass. Now, you're probably going to see more people here than you're going to see mostly on the trail, really anywhere on the trail until the end. And that's because people are going to be coming in on these feeder trails here, and they're going to be summiting Utah's highest point, which is called King's Peak, which is right here. Now, Anderson Pass is the saddle below it. It's about, it looks like it's about 1,000 feet, even less even less than a thousand, about 800 feet less than King's Peak. But King's Peak is a super scramble. I didn't elect to do it. Some people do on the UHT, excuse, but my my objective was just to complete the Uinta High Line. So I did not want to waste any gas going up there. Now, the descent off of Anderson Pass is glorious compared to North Pole Pass. I mean, literally night and day difference. It's great. It's actually quite smooth. There's not as many big rocks. And so when I got in down into there, I could see some tents down here over by Yellowstone Creek. And that's eventually where I camping was on Yellowstone Creek, which was a really cool camp spot. Probably one of my favorite on the trip because you have a really awesome view. That whole ridge line of Kings Peak, South Kings Peak and Anderson Pass. And it's a really, really neat place to camp. Now from Yellowstone Pass the next day, is you're going to make your way up Tungsten Pass. Now, between Yellowstone and Tungsten Pass, that was the worst mosquitoes I had experienced up until that point. Really bad. And it's really going to be bad for the rest of the trip from that point on. I think that's where, it, I mean, mosquitoes were always bad everywhere, 
but like they were really, really bad through here. And one of the things too is you want to make sure that you're treating your clothes with permethrin before you go out. And then I use picaridin from Sawyer to keep them, and it did a really, really good job to keep them off of my skin. But man, were they annoying. It was really, really bad. So you come through here and you eventually go up Tungsten Pass, quite an easy pass to get up. And then you come down into Tungsten Lake. Okay, cool. The next pass that you're going to have is Porcupine Pass at 12-2. And this is one of my favorite views. When you get to the top of this pass, is going to be a great, great view of this valley to the southwest. Huge, huge expanse of valley. You're going to be able to see all the way down to Explorer Peak here, miles and miles away. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really neat pass. And probably the easiest miles are coming between Porcupine Pass and the valley below. So very, very easy walking miles, easy to navigate, not too wet of feet or anything like that. So it's a lot easier walking than most of the rocky stuff that you had just been doing for the last 25, 30 miles. So after that, you're going to come up to Red Knob Pass. And again, one of my favorite, that this is actually probably my favorite view of the entire trip was up Red Knob Pass. Awesome, awesome views. You're going to see down into this valley below. There was a ton of elk in the meadows down here, which was awesome. There's going to be a ton of elk you'll probably see on the trip anyway, regardless. But from there, you can actually see to the southwest, you can actually see your next target, which for me was Dead Horse Lake. So you make this giant descent down, pretty easy descent, and then you have to make an ascent back up to Dead Horse, and you're going to be camping at almost 11,000 feet. So for me, I didn't sleep that well. You know, it's pretty high to sleep at. even being acclimated as, as well as I was, I felt like for this trip, but we didn't sleep that well. A ton of mosquitoes here. Gosh, one of the worst places again for mosquitoes. And the next pass that you have to get over is called Dead Horse Pass, which apparently because freaking horses would come up here and then die because it was steep. A lot of people were wigging out about this pass. I was kind of wigging out a little bit about it because a lot of times with these passes, it looks worse from where you're looking at it than it actually does when you're on it. So that's one thing I've learned from high routes is that it always looks worse from a distance than usually what it looks like up close. So always take that with a grain of salt and like don't get totally wigged out about it. I was kind of wigged out because I thought that there may be a snowfield to cross up there, but there wasn't. And so the next day, woke up, did the pass. It was super, super easy. I mean, I understand really why anybody is I mean I guess maybe if there's snow up there but it was kind of like all the other passes maybe a little bit steeper but did not live up to as much of the hype as I thought and way too anxious about it It was really stupid so the next thing that you have to do after that is you eventually are going to be descending a little bit and going through all of these areas here which is Still kind of hard walking. I mean, some of it's easy walking, but again, most of it is going to be feet wet, a bunch of giant rocks that you have to walk over. One of the worst parts of the trip. Between Dead Horse Pass and Rocky Sea Pass, you have a couple options of what to do to get through this area. Now, the, all trails map up and around right here, around these lakes on some type of freaking trail. I don't know what it is. More mileage. The actual high line connects, or the actual high line kind of bisects that. But what it does is it drops down basically 800 feet and then ascends 800. Whereas the first one, the all trails track, kind of is more miles, but you're not dropping and gaining bird again. Well, what happened to us is that I met up with these two other people finally at Dead Horse Lake, and we actually ended up missing the turn for the high line. So what did we do is we just took this Jack and Jill trail that bisects both of them, actually, the all trails and the hotline, and thought that we would be good. And that was a very bad mistake because a lot of this is burned and burned and a lot of blowdown, super thick, rocky. It was the worst part of the trail and the slowest part of the trail by far. Wasn't there wasn't really even a trail for a lot of times that we follow. So I would recommend either going this north side. I mean, when we eventually got back to this trail, I never even saw a cutoff for the high line. So so I'm not quite sure exactly what that was about. 
there even is the trail there. Because again, sometimes the map says the trail's there, but sometimes it's actually not there. It's just kind of it rolls with this <laughs> this trail. So be aware of that. This section just sucks. I'd probably recommend just going with the actual all trails route on this one, but knowing there is going to definitely still be blowdown either way. Especially though, you're going to get to Rocky Seat, easy one. And what it, actually, there was a little bit of a hanging field right here, and it, with the gal that I was with. Out. But for me, it was and if you're if you're experienced snow traveler, it was fine. Again, no micro spikes, but a lingering snow here that had to go right through. Okay, then you start descending now down and towards Hayden Pass. As you, as you can probably guess, you're going to start encountering more people. It's a six mile from the trailhead here. And uh, so that was a welcome site to actually see people, which is pretty cool. But really uneventful after your descent from Rocky Sea Pass. It, you're really not seeing much be in the forest, the burn. It's actually a quite ugly end of the trail in my opinion the other thing is that you actually ascend a little bit to get to the ending trail a really bizarre i had never actually ascended something to get to the end of a through hike so that was really interesting now for me i had to wait another night in order to get picked up by the shuttle so is what i did was i kicked it from the high line to the butterfly lake campground and i just jacked the spot and slept there for the night, walked back up the road and chilled at the high line to be picked up in the morning for the shuttle. Like I said, at the start of this, if you want a free download of my personal itinerary for this, that you can customize for yourself, all the stuff that you need for it, elevation, mileage, all that type of stuff, go ahead and look down below and download that to YouTube and Spotify. And then if you could, if this is going to be helpful for you, please subscribe and like video please give a five star rating on spotify super super appreciate that it really helps me out and watch out for more videos on the you want the highline i'm going to be doing a 10 things i wish i knew I'm going to be doing a big documentary on it once i actually get to and i'm on the trip here but once i get time i'll be doing all that. so be sure to check that as well we'll see you for the next video